Let's take a look at how we can approach the music of the early jazz era, the 1920s. I'm Ron Rodos, and thank you for being here for our journey through the real book, number 148. One every week, going through the book in order, and yes, we're up to Heebie Jeebies, which is one of the most famous early jazz tunes because it's credited as being the first real recorded instance of scat singing. But we'll get to that in a second. So, a couple things about this. First of all, the tune itself. It's, um, it's written here in the key of G. It's by Boyd Atkins, by the way, who was a saxophonist, um, and I think violinist, who had worked with Armstrong. The title heebie-jeebies comes from uh, a dance craze of the 20s, and the term itself is slang for kind of uh, um, uh, feeling uh, uh, like nervous energy, a little anxious, and, and in this way, kind of in a fun way. And, you know, 20s was this time of uh, dancing in, in a little more wild way than the people had danced, at least publicly before then, at least that we know. And um, uh, so there's a dance craze from 1923. There's uh, several songs, at least, written with this title. I tried to find the original sheet music, and I couldn't find it. Maybe you can find it and put a link in the um, uh, comments for the video. The original, not, not the lead sheet, not the Armstrong version, but the Boyd Atkins um, sheet music, you know, piano vocal score, which must have existed, I'm guessing, um, back then. I couldn't find it online. Please let us know if you can find it, because the tune here is written in the key of G, but Armstrong plays it in a, um, up, up a half step in A flat, starting on the five chord in E flat seven. Makes a lot more sense, right? Because then that would put the trumpet up a whole step in B flat rather than the key of A. Armstrong could probably play in every key, but not everybody could in the jazz world at that time. So makes a lot more sense that's in a common key for jazz. But who really knows the whole story? I'm guessing the original sheet music was in G. That's why it's in G here. But this, uh, it's interesting. I don't really say this too much, uh, but uh, some of the real book tunes, you know, there's different versions. Um, this does not reflect the melody that Armstrong plays. For instance, at the end, they go, I'm playing this in A flat down. And he goes, I don't know, what was him sort of improvising a melody and what was the original, I don't know. Okay. I usually play it more like Armstrong. Some of the changes are a little suspect here. In uh, measure one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, it has the uh, sixth chord, E7 here. Um, I leave that one out because I don't hear them really playing it on the recording. But, um, you know, do what you like. Um, also on the recording, there's a little section that's not here. It's after they play the tune, I think once through. Um, and, and I suspect that there was a verse out front, like there was in a lot of those old tunes, you know. Um, different type of music leading into it, kind of like in the opera world, recitative and aria that got translated through operetta into American popular song of the early 20th, 20th century. And you get these great verses before the, the tunes. They're really worth uh, learning. Um, a lot of them are great in themselves. Stardust has a particularly great verse. And uh, Sinatra, actually Frank Sinatra, when he recorded Stardust in one of his versions with a big string orchestra, um, I think late 50s, maybe 58, 59, he only did the verse. He wanted to make a point that that tune had such a great verse. So check out the verse to Stardust if you don't know it yet. And the Louis Armstrong version. See how th this always uh, ties together, all this stuff. That's what we're getting at, the culture that produced the, this music. So the 1920s was very um, uh, vibrant in terms of jazz. Um, there was an explosion of, um, of uh, different, uh, I guess, creativity, explosion of creativity. And if you listen to the uh, Louis Armstrong Hot Fives and Hot Sevens, which produced heebie-jeebies, you hear um, uh, a wide variety of, um, say, arranging techniques. The, um, the, the, the music of the 20s and early jazz, even though it's sort of considered like not mainstream anymore, right? We tend to think of swing and, and more particularly bebop and Miles Davis type stuff, post-bop from the 50s as being mainstream now. If, um, if jazz stopped in 1930, it would be comparable to say the Baroque period in, in classical music. When we think of classical, we tend to think of Mozart, Beethoven, Brahms, you know, that, that's the, the standard era, right? Classical music. But um, 
the, the and, and Bach, of course, for pianists. But basically, the Baroque is kind of like, okay, that's an older style. But it was so varied, right? Monteverdi, Bach, Vivaldi, Handel. At first glance, they might kind of sound similar. And then when you get into it, there's so many differences. One's more lyrical, one's more contrapuntal, one's more chordal, like some of Monteverdi's two choir pieces, right? Bach didn't write music that way. Not the same way as Monteverdi. Very different if you really get into it. And early jazz is like that. One great example of someone who um, really appreciated this music and we can learn from him was the arranger Gil Evans, who's famous for working with Miles Davis. They were best friends for many, many, many years till the end of, um, I think, Gil went first, yes. So um, uh, uh, Gil Evans, who was very modern and all that, was apparently one of the world's best experts at this music, Louis Armstrong's recordings. And in an interview, Gil said that in every single Louis Armstrong recording, there was one spot, at least, that was just magical. One spot, whether it was something that Armstrong played, or I suspect him being an arranger, uh, an arrangement feature. So just as an example, this is what I would do. If you're, if you're an arranger out there, or if you have your own jazz band, you've been playing very, quote, modern contemporary music, this is what I would do. I would uh, go through a tune like Heebie Jeebies, which on the surface sounds very old fashioned, right, and, and fun. Um, and I would make a little chart, um, just handwritten, not an arranging chart, music, but uh, handwritten notes, words. And I would describe what's going on. So if you listen to this recording, they start with um, uh, uh, a Charleston feel. It's not related to the song itself. It's just that was a new rhythm at the time, you know, 20 years before then, and early jazz, the Charleston, big, dance craze too. And then there's a trombone glissando to the tune itself. And then they all come in. So three things happening right before the tune gets even established. We have this Charleston rhythm, we have a tr trombone glissando, and then we have the melody. It's like turning this kaleidoscope and you see different colors or different feels and different instrumentation, even with five musicians. They're getting a lot of variety from a small group of musicians. I would do something similar. So even if you're doing something very, um, uh, you know, let's say bebop or something like that. You're playing, you know, Charlie Parker's Confirmation. You could take something like that. You could, you don't have to do Charleston. You can just do any rhythm. You know, you know. kind of sounds like uh, what the intro to uh, Shawn Up by Dizzy Gillespie. And then you do that for a while, and then you do something else that's surprising, whether it's a glissando or whether it's a fill. take the arranging techniques that they used here, which are so creative and so varied and compressed within a short period of time, and you do the same thing, but in your own way. That's how you develop your own style, and that's how you um, really um, sort of uh, mine, M-I-N-E, like you're, you're, you're digging for gold, right? You're mining this valuable um, uh, approach to music from what they did, but sounding in your own way. You can do that. So. The next thing is to um, uh, uh, look at what um, uh, Armstrong did and decide whether you're going to uh, play the same way or not. So it's early jazz, so I could sit down and I could say, okay, well, I'm going to play stride, right? Because there's stride piano on there. into the swing era in the 30s, they started playing with a different feel. Benny Carter, the uh, great saxophonist, did this with I think his big band, and, and, and he has more of a swing. It's more like a walking bass. See, it still works. It's still great. You know, Armstrong himself, when he came back in the 40s with the uh, uh, Louis Armstrong All-Stars, and he brought back some of those same players he had worked with early on, and it's sort of like the New Orleans Revival, Dixieland Revival of the 40s, 
and, and that group was a big hit. Sure, on the surface it sounded like the 20s because he had the front line of trumpet, trombone, and clarinet, but the rhythm section was playing 30 swings. He wasn't playing with the same rhythmic feel that people did in the 20s. That would have sounded, at that time, anachronistic or old-fashioned or non-commercial, however you want to put it. He was a big star, you know? Similar way, actually, with our, to continue our Baroque analogy, when Mozart, who was born only six years after Bach died in uh, 1756, uh, Mozart's birth, um, he was hired to arrange um, Handel's Messiah for a big Baroque piece, right? Hallelujah Chorus and all that. And he actually added clarinets because that was um, in vogue at the time. So they respected the original, but they did make it of their own day. So now we have the choice. We can either play it exactly like it was then, as much as we can, or sort of do it our own way. And uh, so what I think I'll do here, oh, oh, the, the, the scat singing, forgot to mention that. So the legend is that Armstrong had his vocals and he's singing the tune, which you can hear, got the heebies, heebie jeebies, and, uh, and he dropped the music. And he couldn't read the lyrics after a while, so he just started going, zow, zow, ba -doo -ba, you know, scat singing on the recording. That may have happened, who knows, right? But um, far more likely is that um, he uh, he had been doing that. We know that on street corners. He grew up singing in a quartet with kids on street corners and improvising and doing that kind of thing. You know, great story is that his wife, Lil Harden Armstrong, who really did a lot of this arranging and played great piano and was um, a big influence on sort of getting him to dress up nicely and become a big star, getting that mentality that she could be a star. She really pushed him that way. Um, she heard him singing, probably teenagers, and, you know, or early 20s, and heard him scat singing. She said, the day you can play trumpet as good as you can sing, scat sing, that's the day you'll be a star. Isn't that interesting? And then he, he could do it and became the star. So um, I heard something on the radio. So, so he was probably doing that in the studio and probably did it live. It was apparently in the air. There's a great moment, and I don't think it's on YouTube or available, but I heard on WKCR, Columbia University's radio station, they were playing some recordings Armstrong had made. He lived in Queens, and New, you know, borough of New York City, and he would um, sort of be like a DJ and make recordings. I don't know what happened to them in his life, if they were broadcast or not, but he would play records and say, here's, here's, here's Lewis, I'm, I'm gonna play this now. And, um, he had gotten a copy of the recordings that Jelly Roll Morton do um, for the Library of Congress in the 30s. And this is in the, I think, 50s. Armstrong hadn't heard them yet. Maybe they were just released. And he's saying, okay, I'm going to play this. And of course, he knew Armstrong a little bit. Armstrong, uh, uh, he knew uh, Morton a little bit. Morton was a little earlier than him and had left um, uh, New Orleans early. But um, I'm sure they, they met. I don't know all the details. But in any case, he said, okay, we're going to listen to this about New Orleans. Jelly Roll knows more about New Orleans than anybody else. It's where I came from. And he puts on the recording. You can hear this on this recording. I hope it's released someday. The first thing that he coincidentally hears is the part where Jelly Roll Morton is saying, you know, everybody thinks that Louis Armstrong invented scat singing in 1926 or whatever with heebie-jeebies, but I'm here to tell you that I, Jelly Roll Morton, was doing it 20 years earlier, and in fact, everybody was. The comedians used to stand up there on the vaudeville stage and scat sing. So Louis Armstrong did not invent scat singing, and Armstrong is listening to this, having developed a reputation for inventing scat singing with heebie-jeebies, and he just goes ballistic. He goes, oh, okay, okay, he stops the recording, goes, okay, Jelly. You, and he starts talking to this recording as if our, our, uh, Jelly Roll Morton is still alive. And he says, you know, that, 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 that may be true. Okay, that may be true, but as far as we're concerned, this was the first time it was on recording, and this person verified it, and this person verified it, and this is what we all know. And then he ends up sort of insulting Morton, saying, you know, you left New Orleans, and who knows what you did, you know? And I'm the big star, he's basically saying. And I think he ends with saying, I'm still here, and you're six foot underground. Like, whoa. It's a great moment. I, I hope they release that, but you can, you can hear it here at least. All right, so I'm going to start out taking the opposite approach that we usually do. We hear these recordings of so much going on. 
And I'm going to start, um, I was listening to John Lewis from the Modern Jazz Quartet play on Marion McPartland's um, Piano Jazz Radio Show the other day. And I was so impressed that he'll start out, he'll start out a blues just like... Just the right hand, solo piano, implying the, the accompaniment and everything. And then he, then he bring it in. So I'm going to bring in a similar approach. I'm not sure when my left hand's going to come in. And then see what grows out of that. I love, I love that. And he also does these cool things with block chords where he kind of rolls them a little, like an old time banjo or guitar. John Lewis, Modern Jazz Quartet, check him out. And his solo recordings are great too. Here we go. tune to play. You know, um, it, it, it all goes back to all those things that I talked about beforehand, about the getting into the, the whole stride feel, but then letting that go when you want, and see, you know, I got in some bluesy stuff. You know, and anything that we know can be brought to a tune like this, and I think for most people, the more you know about the original and the culture it came from and all the, the possibilities and the stories behind the songs, the, 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 the more you can then express what you want to express through it, not sort of imposing it on top in a, in a sort of surfacey way, at least for most people. 
Thanks for being here. If you're interested in one-on-one -on -one lessons, I teach on Skype, Zoom, other platforms, whatever works for you, or my video course at keyboardimprov.com. And good luck with your music. Check out heebie-jeebies, and then next time we'll be on to the next tune, Here's That Rainy Day, which I'm looking forward to because I played that on Broadway. Have a good day.